Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 779. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is December 30th, 2022. All right, well, thank you for joining us for another show of Anglican Unscripted. Uh, as you can tell by the background, there's snow back there. I'm still in Wisconsin. Uh, I've been here for about three weeks uh, visiting with Dad before he passed on uh, Christmas Eve. And I want to thank you all on Facebook and other places for sending your condolences. Uh, just amazing to read the comments and your prayers. And some of you uh, uh, took... Uh, you know, my my father James and our family to the altar the next day for Christmas and prayed for us and we really appreciate that that's kind of the, the nature of this community and uh, just know that we had a great uh, visit with dad before he passed away because he rallied the last two weeks when we got here uh, dad could barely take uh, uh, fluid through his spoon and a week later he's popping the old protein shakes and you know having a great time and so we really appreciate the time we got to spend with him and i appreciate you as the audience and and facebook friends for helping out with all that uh george how you doing in florida oh just fine as you can see i'm dog sitting this morning uh, i've got three little dogs asleep farting and snoring in the background so if they interrupt the show i my apologies in advance Coming off of a head cold I caught on Christmas, we had uh, two shows on Christmas Eve, two shows on Christmas Day, then three nursing home uh, shows. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I Christmas, St. Stephen's Day, the day after I did home visitations. And on Tuesday morning, when I woke up after two days of nonstop activity, I was floored, just wiped out. One of these little old ladies has some sort of flu or respiratory virus that I got picked mm -hmm. up from her. And now it's Friday and I'm finally able to talk without sounding like I smoked a pack of Lucky Strikes or something just before airtime. All right, it's time to move on to some news. Let me pull up the uh, the theme sheet here. Mar margin. <laughs> Martin Sargent has been sentenced to prison for stealing five million pounds. Now, we reported on this a couple weeks ago and alluded to it months ago that there was a person in the Diocese of London who was a layperson who had uh, fingers on money. And now we're learning more and more about it now that the court docs have been released and we need to talk about this because this is not a conservative story, not a liberal story. Uh, it's a church story. And it's a church story felt in every denomination. And we're going to talk about the Church of England because it seems with all of their uh, committees and safety uh, uh, systems they've set up, they've not been able to catch somebody in the till. And let's talk a little bit about Martin Sargent. He made $5 million, George. Wow. On top of his salary. <laughs> <laughs> five million pounds, yes. Martin Sargent, uh, just before Christmas, was sentenced to five years imprisonment for embezzling over five, 5.2 million pounds from various Diocese of London trusts over which he had control. <clears throat> and in the uh, final court proceedings, some things came out which were just discreditable to the Church of England Diocese of London's management. Turns out that the job Sargent had before he came to the Diocese of London, he had been responsible for theft. He, he stole from them and was jailed for 18 months for embezzlement. Okay, and so he goes to here, here. Let, let's set this up. Convicted felon for embezzlement now works for the Diocese of London. In charge of money. <laughs> With no oversight. Now, I don't know how exactly how this happened. Mm -hmm. But what you can sort of piece together from the reports from the court proceedings was that Sargent was brought on board to the Diocese of London as a contractor. And the Church of England will do this so they don't have to pay benefits to right. people. It's cheaper to pay bas basically for a contractor. And once he was there, Sargent was one of these sort of uh, oily oleaginous people who basically expanded into uh, every little job such that he soon became indispensable. And after a while, he was brought on staff. And he evidently was had a very good reputation with his bishop, Richard Charters, who really found him a wonderful fellow. And he was good at what people thought was his job. 
Well, he was good at that. Plus, he was good at feathering his own nest. He would he would generate false invoices for repair to some church property. He would create false grant requests and then siphon the money into his own hands. And he would use this money to go on gambling junkets. He would buy real estate. He basically used the Diocese of London's trust funds as a piggy bank to finance a very lavish lifestyle that nobody seemed to pick up upon. And it was only after he retired that the new fellows coming in to sort of see what needed to be done began to realize, oh my goodness, oh my, here's an invoice, but there's no uh, <clears throat> accompanying documents showing receipt of the building materials. All right. Uh, you know, which you do in, a, in, a, in any business. So you got an invoice, you don't pay it until you get the, uh, the uh, receipt showing you took possession of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the whole house of cards fell apart. And it was turned over to the police, and now this guy's five five years, five million dollars. Well, let's talk about the hypo the, the hypo hypocrisy here. A clergy person in the diocese of London or in the Church of England can't pass gas without being written up uh, and, and thrown before the scapegoating. That's not the real name, but the scapegoating committee. Here, a lay person has access to the checkbooks, has signals, single signature uh, authority over the checking accounts, and can get away with an extremely lavish lifestyle in front of his fellow, fellow clergyman and laity at the diocesan office, and nobody says a word. That's hypocrisy. The, yeah, and in other words, the I've written, I don't know how many stories about some poor sap keep pockets funeral fees and gets kicked out of the ministry for stealing a thousand two thousand pounds i'm not saying that's right but the oversight of the local area dean and the archdeacon they're always in your nose always going through your finances always going through everything and you do in your life both financially and safeguarding and this and that the the bureaucracy is so overwhelmingly stifling that it chills so much of the energy and life of a parish priest. Whereas that degree of uh, supervision, that degree of accountability is non-existent. We've now discovered in the higher echelons. Right. Bishops are not disciplined. If they are, it's only when a political point needs to be made. Senior staffers are not disciplined. Um, people can engage in rank bullying and violating you know, people's dignity and human rights and all this and that. And if they have a few colored buttons on their vestments, it doesn't matter. But if they're a parish priest, watch out. They'll go into limbo for a year and a half, two years, until the diocese decides what to do. Uh, and I don't want to make light of this because we had a person who was accused, a clergy person, uh, accused of sexual misconduct, and the he went into the limbo. And eventually ended up committing suicide because there was no ability for him to resolve the situation that he found himself in. Yeah, and, yeah, and this case in the Diocese of London, of which you speak, Kevin, <clears throat> it began when Martin Sargent had his exit interview when he was retiring. Um, he was asked, uh, well, what should we keep, be keeping an eye out? And they said, well, look after this guy. He may like little boys. No evidence. Nothing. Just... People knew that this priest yeah. was gay. Innuendo. And innuendo. Yeah. And it just people began to look into this this parish priest and the and the pressure and the accusations and the just got too much for him and he took his own life. And the coroner's report uh, basically said the Church of England, Diocese of London did a miserable job. Now one of the things, the reasons, one of the reasons touted for making uh, the bit, the current Bishop of London a Bishop of London was that she was an excellent administrator. She was the chief nurse in the National Health Service at one point. Well, and has no real theological training or background education. She went to a theological night school in right. the diocese. Uh, it's not and, south, south and that, that's that's evidence group. through her for, through her preaching. You can tell that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny when, uh, as an aside, I, I still get a chuckle out of this. When uh, she, at the Queen's funeral, uh, there's the point, and do thy ministers with righteousness. 
is the phrase that you yep. hear in the prayers of the people. She said, endure thy ministers. <laughs> and I thought it was, you know, That's... endure government ministers. With her. And, okay. The, the irony. Okay, she doesn't understand the language she's using. Okay. That's fine. Uh, but it, it was cute. Is, you okay. Know, you, you can hire administrators to be bishops, but if they're not Christians, they're not going to be good bishops. You can hire Christian who are good in business. That's what you want, ideally, in a vestry. Yes, you do. Parish. Uh -huh. But this either or of Richard Charters, wonderful Christian, didn't really do a good job of supervision. Uh, Sarah Mullally, no real theological gravitas, no. but great reputation as administrator. A great nurse, absolutely. Great nurse, yeah. a great administrator of nurses. Um, mm -hmm. They just are trying to plug holes in this dike without realizing the water is not only coming through the holes, but it's coming over the top of the dike. And these stopgap measures are just killing the church, hmm? in my okay. humble opinion. No, but we saw it kill the church. We saw this happen in the Episcopal Church in the 1990s. Presiding Bishop Browning had a treasurer who did the same thing. And it was two million dollars back then which is still more than five million pounds now uh so this isn't a theological thing this isn't liberal or conservative this can happen anywhere george mm -hmm. okay. so long as men are wicked and fallen and corrupt you will have theft so mm -hmm. the issue for me is theft i'm not surprised that somebody who had an opportunity to steal would steal what i'm surprised at is the incompetence and ineptness of the system in place to make sure that people don't steal. Yeah. It's heavy handed when it comes to clergy. It's non existent when it comes to people who actually control the money. From Next what I've story. Seen in this no, and, and agreed. And, uh, you know, we're, we're 2,000 years out from when G uh, Judas uh, uh, betrayed Jesus for 30 silver pieces. So uh, it's going to continue to happen in our church. I just hope that we can have some safeguarding opportunities where we don't hire convicted felons for fiduciary jo uh, roles in our church. All right, let's move on to our first story. A, a lot of people wonder how we get our, our, our sources and our intel. And a lot of it is just being passive. You'll see something fly by here, an email there, a Facebook post there. Uh, somebody has an offhand comment over here. An interview or some of your interviewing says something like, ah, oh, that doesn't make any sense. But you look into it and you're like, whoa. A couple weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, George said, Kevin, one of the heads of the church in Nigeria is in Houston this week. He posted that he's going to some space thing uh, on, on his Facebook page, and I wonder if that means anything. I asked around, and I was told it means nothing. Nope. Nothing. Nope, nothing. nothing. <laughs> However, <laughs> two weeks later, we discover it meant something, George. Yeah, Kevin, we, Kevin and I run the Anglican version of the National Security Agency, where we monitor <laughs> uh, social media and internet traffic. Yeah. And we tap phones and... Somebody, we once sent a birthday card to somebody's wife, a uh, birthday greetings to somebody's wife, and they wanted to know how we knew it. And mm -hmm. We just told them we know everything. Uh, well, we're looking at Facebook, scrolling through, and we noticed that somebody is visiting the Houston Space Center, who is the Archdeacon for External Affairs of the Church of Nigeria. Hmm. Now, what is in Houston, Texas? Felix Orgy. What's <laughs> happening right now? <laughs> Chaos. Hey, Felix Orgy. Chaos. So there were high-level talks between the Church of Nigeria and the Anglican Church of North America about the transfer, transition from Felix Orgy and his suffragan to the Anglican Church in North America, along with his diocese. And originally it was announced that this was going to happen, and the Church of Nigeria responded badly and suspended him. But after these talks took place, it's now all been smoothed out. Everything is all okay, okie dokie. And now this happened at the same time as the Augustine Uig Uigbe, uh, the New Jersey fracas. So there's plenty to talk about between the Church of Nigeria and the ACNA. <clears throat> and the deeper issue here isn't so much Felix Orgy. This, the trajectory was there uh, of Felix Orgy and the Church of Nigeria 
in North America sort of coming into the ACNA because the American mind is that, you know, when you come to the United States, you become an American over time. Yep. You don't remain a Nigerian living in the United States. That's sort of a national thinking that we assimilate, we amalgamate. Well, it's a melting pot. The Big Church melting Nigeria pot. Views, Church of Nigeria views its people in other countries as it's more of a tossed salad. You're tossed about in this mix, but you remain Nigerian. And there's been a tension between the ACNA and the Church of Nigeria because the Church of Nigeria wants to hold on to Nigerians who emigrate to the US, to the UK, to other countries. And because there's no real relations with the Church of England, the Church of Nigeria is very happy to set up their own Nigerian chaplaincies and do their own thing in Nigeria. But in the United States with the ACNA, now, now for 10 plus years in the picture, how does this sort of work? Do you become a Nigerian in America now, if you're only going to be there for three, four years, that's one thing. But mm -hmm. these are people who are permanent migrants to the United States, who are getting to attend churches that are not just purely people of your own ethnicity, but people from other backgrounds, other races, tribes, cultures, whatnot. And I'm happy to say it looks like the ACNA and the Church of Nigeria today, at any rate, have reached some sort of entente on these issues. They're not settled by any means, no. but at least there's positive movement. Well, it's a difficult situation because when the ACNA was formed and before its formation, the primates who offered uh, church oversight here in America made a promise that when there is finally a, a good destination for Anglicans to go to, we will back off and we will uh, turn over the bishops. Uganda did this with uh, their two American bishops that they consecrated. Uh, Kenya did this and uh, Rwanda, Congo, Rwanda, you know, a little bit more difficult. But uh, so we find ourselves in this mix where uh, the last holdout is Nigeria. Nigeria, would you p please uh, uh, allow Nigerians to go to Anglican churches and uh, where we allow that all uh, Anglican churches on American soil are ACNA, uh, so we're not doing border crossing and uh, cr you know, cross uh, politics and stuff like that. Can, can you help us out here? The previous uh, two archbishops ago said, yeah, no problem. The new archbishop says, well, we, we kind of built up a kingdom here. We like it. You know, we, we like the kingdom we have in America. And so we're not going to do it now. Maybe in the future we'll turn it over. And it was always that passing on down the road. We'll kick that can down the road until we decide it's appropriate to, to release Nigerian churches to the ACNA. And it never happened. And now Felix Orji has successfully brought his churches into the ACNA with a little bit of chaos. Kind of the way things happen here, George. So it's good to see. Well, it, it's an amusing sense in this way in that it's basically a re role reversal <clears throat> of church policy versus uh, American foreign policy. American foreign policy, of course, has always been we're going to make little Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan yeah. uh, uh, because how we do it is God's way and therefore you will just do it naturally. Once you get rid of you know, your, your Saddam Husseins and the Taliban, you'll naturally uh, have a democracy like a Vermont town hall meeting. And of course, the world says, no, we don't want to be Americans. If we wanted to be Americans, we'd be in uh, <clears throat> El Paso right now trying to get over the border. Um, and so the Church of Nigeria has sort of an American foreign policy mindset yeah. that everybody should be Nigerian. Whereas, uh, the ACNA is saying, if you've come to this country, uh, you should. Uh, and if you believe in Jesus Christ and worship the Anglican way, and you don't buy the Episcopal uh, Kool-Aid, you should be part of this ACNA. And it, it, it's rather funny uh, to see sort of role reversals between secular and religious life. It's interesting you brought up world politics, too, because uh, in general, the last three uh three decades, we've had no success in broadcasting uh, democracy to regions at war, uh, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, all those turbulent places in the Middle East. Yet at one point we had success. When Japan fell, 
they adopted an American constitution. And when Germany fell, there was a, an adoption of the West values and stuff like that. Other than that, we're batting even, zero. <laughs> well, no, even South Korea. Yes, um, South Korea. Yeah. South Korea took time to move mm-hmm. from a an autocracy to its democratic today, but mm-hmm. culture, you know, you can't, America has a unique culture and <clears throat> I don't mean to be critical of our, our own country, but we are so blind to the reality. Um, somebody once told me on a visit, America's not another country, it's another planet. Uh, and Americans like it that way. We just see the, I mean, we don't, by and large, the average American is uninterested in world politics. They're uninterested in things that happen all outside of our shores. The world is the United States. And that's just the way it has almost always been in the United States. And But in the last 30, 40 years, we've had an elite who basically decided that, that we need to be interventionist. Uh, you know, you go back to, basically, I blame Lyndon Maines Johnson. Uh, Johnson? You blame Johnson? <laughs> well, you know, um, it was, you know, it was the, it, the U.S. Army told LBJ that Vietnam was unwinnable. That's right. Yeah. Um, and LBJ said, I can't politically afford to lose a war. And so I'll just keep throwing troops in. And because the Vietnamese didn't want to be little Americans. Yeah. Um, and... You know, we've had that same LBJ, Robert McNamara worldview policy that, you know, we are bringing the benefits of Americanism to the world, and most places really don't want it. Um, They don't want it, and we also don't, we've lost the ability to fight a war. Okay, uh, the last war we had was World War II. Uh, Vietnam was not a war because we would not participate in it as a war. We were consultants and advisors, and we just had troops there to help train people. Uh, the same in Iraq. We uh, Okay, kicking Saddam out of Kuwait was war, but after that, we just we didn't participate in what you needed to do to win a war. In and, fact, you're, you're absolutely right, Kevin, and I think it goes back to Douglas MacArthur and Harry that's Truman. Who I, yep, that's who I blame. MacArthur yeah. said, look, Mm-hmm. If you want to win this war, this is what we need to do. We need to invade China. We need to bring Chiang Kai-shek and his troops from Taiwan, mm-hmm. engage the Chinese, and we can win this war. But Truman said, no, 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 let's just, you know. <clears throat> so MacArthur wanted to win the war. Truman wanted to survive the war, politically, economically, this and that. Mm-hmm. And so we've never really truly been at war since, as you say, Kevin, World War II. Um and so, like, we don't understand, you know, what's happening in the Ukraine right now because the Russians sort of started off the war on the cheap. And now they're basically decided, well, this is, you know, this is a war to the death for yeah. us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we don't, you know, if we if we roll over the Ukrainians, what else are the Americans going to do to us? So, you know, American foreign policy is just so silly. Nope. Is that a nice way to say it's silly? <laughs> it's silly. Well, it, it yeah, you know, it's interesting. We, we've conversed into this, and hopefully the audience is still sticking around. But um, when you look at uh, world history for the last 3,300 years, only those who won the wars uh, were willing to put everything on the line. Okay. And if you're not willing Kevin. to put everything on the line to win the war... You're in this mud, this toxic mud, and America looks bad because we participate in uh, military action. We don't care if we win or lose. Kevin, this ties in so well to the next story about Charlie oh. Holt. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, we posted an Anglican Inc. Uh, press release from Charlie who said, in, in basics, listen, if a church so desires to have same-sex blessings or weddings, um, I will capitulate and allow that church in the Diocese of Florida to do so if I am approved by the House of Bishops. That, now, as a person who has fought this sex war in the Episcopal Church for decades, my, my heart says he's capitulating and 
dang it all, I hope he loses. And this is ridiculous. What, what are we fighting for? The, the last conservative in the Episcopal Church says, yeah, it can happen here in my diocese, I don't care. Part of me says, well, is he just telling the House of Bishops what they, what they want to hear? And the, and the very cynical side of me says, even if you tell the House of Bishops what they want to hear, they're not going to elect him anyway. Yeah, um, I know Charlie Holt very well. He was in the same diocese as I am, rector in another parish for, mm -hmm. gosh, 10, 15 years um, before he went over to Texas. And Charlie's now been had the left block in his diocese try to block his election twice now on basically spurious charges. But Charlie's response has been this. I will basically uh, be a hands-off bishop. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. You go ahead and do it. Um, and Charlie doesn't actually, Charlie, in his heart of hearts, I know, uh, well, I don't know what is his don't, heart of heart. Don't speak too, we is. don't want to speak too far into it, but uh, the fruits of but, his ministry his, so far have shown that that's not part of who he is. That's not where he who he is. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe he's making a mistake because I don't believe that accommodation can or will work in such circumstances. Mm -hmm. From the left, when a liberal proud promises to come in and respect the integrity of conservatives so that he gets elected or she gets elected, what that means is once they're in office, then they begin to persecute and drive out the conservatives. You become a puppet. So, I mean, yeah. you be, uh, and you, you'll get driven out. Um, Charlie Holt maybe has 10, 15% of his diocese who are problematic. And unfortunately, it happens to include one or two major parishes, the Cathedral, Holy Trinity, Gainesville, and, so, and one or two churches in Jacksonville, and who are all hot to trot on the gay issue. Well, rather, and Charlie could be doing a liberal version, a conservative version of the liberal practices that say anything to get into office, and then once in office, clean house. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, but that's not really how conservatives work because they tend to honor their word, both in spirit and in deed. So Charlie has basically agreed to capitulate, but will the left ever be satisfied? And the history has shown that they're never satisfied in secular politics or in, or in church politics. George? Now, I will George, say cent George. Central Florida, there's one, there's one basically... You know, Central Florida, because we only have one parish like this, a bishop can be conservative and handle all this, and basically deal with one who doesn't have the strength or the ability or the power to basically cross in a great deal of grief. Um, but when you're dealing with 10 or 15 percent, that looks like it's the tipping point for uh, liberals poisoning the well, peeing in the pool. Do you hear that noise? Sounds like a snoring yeah. dog. <laughs> Several snoring dogs lying in the sunshine, <laughs> uh, listening to Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> so, and, and here's the problem. Uh, you know, in philosophy and in uh, early Christian teachings, uh, one of the things one of my teachers said, uh, is it okay to lie to further the kingdom? That's a big question. Holy in Islam, God. it is okay. In, <laughs> in Islam, Islam, it is, it is okay. okay you know? In Christianity, it is not okay. That's right. Uh, uh, Islam has a tradition that uh, lies to dissemble and to protect Islam are are good. Mm -hmm. Christianity, no, you don't. You stand upon the truth. Um, it, I, in our search process for the no, go it, ahead. Get what I'm you saying. know, I was going to say, you know, but we also through our knowledge of scripture and Christian history has seen how God can use evil for good as well. So it's just one of those things where um, I, I think that you don't go this route to get elected um, and you don't capitulate because we stand on the truth and the truth doesn't change just because you want to be elected. My yeah. fear, I, I agree, Kevin, and my fear is this will be perceived not as accommodation but his weakness yeah. and weakness invites further attacks it doesn't invite compromise 
Okay, there's your advice from Kevin and George. Uh, we reported a story on Anglican Inc. about a person who committed a thought crime, and luckily she was caught on camera uh, committing this thought crime, and she'll be duly punished. But I thought we could talk about this because it's another story out of the U.K. Her name is Isabel Von Spruce, and she was arrested for praying uh, in a certain location uh, where it's not okay to pray. And this brings out a lot of discussion here on Anglican Unscripted because, ironically, uh, she was praying in the same city where George Orwell died. George. <laughs> so, <laughs> Isabel Vaughn Spruce. Not Vaughn Spruce, not V-O-N Spruce, but what, what, what? V-A-U-G-H-A. Yeah. The, yeah uh, okay. uh, Good. Hyphenated English name. Uh, is a Roman Catholic, and she was standing outside the BPS, BPAS, Robert Clinic in Kings Norton in Birmingham, which is an abortion clinic. And she was not holding a sign. She was not gesticulating. She was not speaking. She was just your average lo person loitering. Mm -hmm. And somebody suspected she might be praying. So they went to a policeman, and the policeman went up to her and said, are you praying? And she said, maybe, I'm thinking about lunch, I'm praying about this. And then the policeman asked, what are you praying for? And she mentioned that she was praying for those women who were going into this place. Aha, you're under arrest for violating a municipal ordinance which criminalizes uh, abortion protests, including prayer and counseling. And she was hauled off, taken to the police station, charged with violating this law told she could not talk to her Catholic priest after she was released on bail. She could not pray anymore. And this has caused a great deal of hubbub in England, uh, in some circumstances, of uh, thought crimes. She was guilty of thinking bad thoughts. She didn't interrupt anybody. She didn't gesticulate. She didn't speak. She didn't hold up a sign. She was silently praying, and this thought crime has led to her arrest let's stop right there and ask ourselves why is the left the liberals the pro-abortion people afraid of prayer why would you include Something silent word. prayer <laughs> why would you include silent prayer in your list of things people can't do within blocks of an abortion facility and the only thing i could think of is they know it works it they know works. prayer the prayer has over time, especially here in America, uh, there's testimony after testimony after testimony where a person was going to an abortion clinic and had their minds changed, not by the signage, not by uh, people wearing uh, uh, death caps and stuff like that, but by the sense that somebody was praying for them, the sense that somebody was spiritually intervening for them, the sense that there was a God and uh, that the baby they were carrying actually had a soul. That sense. And that sense doesn't come from education. That sense doesn't come from uh, any other thing except that sense that God can provide through you through prayer. And so I do see why the liberals would not be afraid of prayer. But boy, you know, from a PR perspective, George, it looks bad. It looks bad. It is bad. If you can criminalize thought... Um the sky's the limit uh yeah. this is uh uh you know we're, we're now into pol pot mao zedong stalin territory of uh political repression i don't I mean, think so I, I i don't think so because if we were in those uh, times george the church of england clergy and the church of england bishops would be martyred in the streets protesting the fact that somebody was arrested for prayer they'd be standing up and marching and say not in our england not in this uk we will not ban prayer and we will not make prayer a thought crime shame on wait wait but oh they didn't do that george yeah where is the bishop of birmingham where is the bishop, not only the Anglican, but the Catholic bishops? Nothing. Where are they? I mean, if I, if I were this woman's priest, I would be there the next day. 
hoping to be arrested. I know. Be, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd be curious to sign arrest me because I'm praying for you. <laughs> and, but you know the. Well, my lack of respect for many many English bishops has been displayed on this show a number of times. Mm -hmm. But I think I would really would not call it bishops, but the elites. Those people who self-consciously separate themselves mm -hmm. from the, the masses uh, think of themselves as better people, more intellectual people, more spiritual people, more special people, who are afraid of the mob, who are afraid of the demos, the, the people, and who don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as King and Savior. They're in charge in this world right now, from the secular governments to the religious institutions. And not having, uh, you know, recently Cardinal Nichols, good for him, he smacked down somebody who uh, took a uh, traditional hymn, I think it was God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, and made it into a woke PC thing that was pro gay, pro. It's pro queer, yes, yeah, yeah. And he said, look, this is just, you can't do this stuff and be part of a uh, civil society where you take things that are important to people and honorable and decent, yeah. and you mock them like this, especially within the church. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. So good for Nichols just standing up here. But um, this is the sort of thing that uh, the church needs. To, you know, the, the Church of England bishops are in, are in Parliament, a number of them, and they ask all these questions and they get involved in all these party political issues. And the one issue that would make a difference for them as Christians, they're silent and absent. It's like Johnson Tamu complaining that, oh, the British government's policy of deporting illegal migrants to Rwanda has climate change implications. I mean, You've got to ask yourself, you know, Johnson Tamu is a loon, okay? Um, and I'm not just saying this now. Go back to when he was advocating for Britain to invade Zimbabwe over Robert Mugabe. Man has no concept of what real war is like. No. Uh, instead, no. he's worried about climate change implications of, of enforcing British immigration law. This is just nonsense. How can you take people like this seriously? What? What intellectual gravitas do these people have? They're fools. Well, I'm they're not just picking on English bishops. I'm picking on the American bishops. I'm, I'm, well, I think government. they're they're fools because they've lost that connection to martyrdom. martyrdom. Mm -hmm. Okay, early uh, Church of England life, early uh, uh, Christian life on the shores of the UK involved martyrdom. And, you know, yeah, yeah. So, it was the case of Thomas Beckett, who was martyred yeah. on the steps of Canterbury Cathedral. Yeah, and there was all this internet Twitter uh, mm -hmm. of Justin Welby commemorating his predecessor's heroism. Well, Justin, you have shown so little heroism. I would actually be embarrassed if I were you to celebrate the, the feast of Thomas Beckett. Because you just are almost the antithesis of Beckett standing up to the powers that be. Beckett defied a king. Yeah. Richard Burton defied Peter O'Toole in the yeah. movie. Ah, uh, stop. <laughs> Justin Welby, who are you defying? Mm -hmm. uh, you're going along to get along. You're seeking to curry favor of the fallen places and leaders of this world, exchanging the gold of, of Jesus Christ for the dross of this world. How can you hold yourself out as an archbishop? How can you allow British society to go so far as to allow thought crime. Mm -hmm. That is, your society has gone from the gender wars to the left-right wars to the sex wars to all these wars where we have now made a section of cities a thought crime if you prayed. And the church has said nothing. Shame on you, Justin Lobby. Shame That's on you, wealthy. anybody wearing purple in the Church of England. This is ridiculous. I want a press release this week saying we don't agree with this. The, I, I, I can't express my anger enough. Of course, I read 1984 yearly, but so what? <laughs> Justin Welby, the man who led the crusade against George Bell. Mm -hmm. George Bell, the Bishop of Chichester, 
who during the middle of the Second World War got up in the House of Lords and condemned the British bombing of German cities as a crime against humanity and immoral. Yeah. Welby condemned this man on spurious charges of child abuse, which were all shown to be absolute nonsense. And Welby, you know, just compare Welby to Bell in their determination to stand for what was right and true against the mob. Bell suffered in his own lifetime because he was refused, uh, he was put forward by the Church of England to be Archbishop of Canterbury when uh, Temple died, and uh, William Winston Churchill said, no way in hell. After what he's done in the House of Lords, I'm not doing this. Now, you've got Welby, who, oh, well, I'm sorry. I don't know but Welby. We don't, so, we don't, but all I that. just look at his actions, and I'm disappointed. We do not need to apologize for this, because the one role of a bishop is to defend the church against what? heresies and uh, ill doctrine and we now have allowed your the church of england has allowed its society to condemn prayer as a thought crime and has said nothing uh, to the anglican communion do you need any other sign that you need new leadership in the anglican communion it, it, to any archbishop out there could you send me some PR press release where you can defend Justin Welby in light of what's happened in this last week with Isabel I mean this this is it this is your shining moment that shows you exactly the heart of the Church of England and the heart of its leadership and it is dark it's time to move on I, I don't mean to be yeah I do mean to be critical I, I mean to you know, if you're going to put your, you know, anything down on anything, you put it down on red. All right. Okay, George, this may surprise you. Today's December 30th. 30th. This is the last Anglican unscriptive of 2022. And, I, you know, kind of, if you're watching the TV cable stations, they have these commemorative, you know, who are the famous people who died this year? Or uh, what are the best stories of the year? And we can do best stories of the year um, for Anglican Unscripted 2. And I picked one, and I thought we could talk about it. If you can think of another one, there's probably a million best stories. It would be the failure of Lambeth 2022, George. Yeah. Well, actually, the Kevin, the story of the year is that I've lost 30 pounds since our January 1st show I last get, year. You, you can't even wear a yeah. collar anymore. You're doing that Justin thing when you wear the collar. I want, congratulations, yeah, George. will be another 30, and then another 30. And in yeah. about 15, 20 years, I'll be down to the weight that I should be. <laughs> uh, You're going to pass me pretty quick. I need to get, get to the gym. Well, you need to get out of the snow country and get on yes, your bike right. again. I do. Yeah. Yes, Kevin, I think you're right. The... Uh, the story of the year internationally in the Anglican world has been, people keep saying Anglican communion is over. It'll still muddle through, but I, I think we passed the tipping point where the, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury is a person of consequence. Well, hold consequence. on. Is a person. He, Justin Welby said, I refuse to lead on this level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and now, strike one. You, you were elected to be leader at this level, and you said you refused to lead at this level. That's, that's a strike, George. And there are others who are willing to fill that vacuum. Mm -hmm. Some of them are the bishops of the Episcopal Church. They're happy to lead if you, you're quiet. They will lead with their money, with their influence, with their access to the media. They will do their best to run the show, and there are bishops in England who will join them in this. Then there are the Gafcon bishops, and nobody's really running after the Nigerians at this point to follow them in leadership. And now there's the Global South bishops and people like Foley Beach. And however this all shakes out, and I'm not, I can't even predict what it's going to look like, Justin has scored enough own goals against himself to make this all but inevitable. Refusal to lead. Uh, cutting off the flow of funds because there aren't any more in England anymore uh, to go to the international communion. Uh, you'll you'll find that, uh, as Malcolm X used to like to say, your chickens will come home to roost. Hmm. Oh. 
Let's see here. Well, we've done a full show, George. Uh, we do ask our audience to help us go to GAFCON 4, uh, held in Kigali, Rwanda. Kigali, Rwanda. And uh, we're raising money for that. We're going to send George over as a, a reporter. We're going to give him a camera. We're going to give him a webcam. And he's going to report daily from uh, GAFCON 4. But in order to do that, we need to raise some funds. And, you know, Kevin, how, how can we help? Well, you can help by going to anglican.inc and click on the Donate button. Uh, we probably we, we have a good 1200 probably needed another 2000 to get George there and back safely, pay for all the conference fees and flights. So if you could be so generous... You have at least one day to use your uh, 2022 tax write-offs to do this. You don't want to do it next year. So please go there and donate through PayPal. We uh, do need some large donations. We had a $500 donation last year, George. So uh, we can uh, certainly hope and pray for more. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I want to make an apology for our last show. I couldn't come up with the name Dominic Steele. Just like our what friend in oh. Australia. <laughs> and he had on his website, he had great fun uh, pointing out, uh, uh, he, he found that amusing, but uh, my apologies. He does a wonderful job out of Sydney with his uh, videos and his interviews. And, mm -hmm. and it was just one of those things where... Uh, you and I suffer from who, old man disease. If you ask me who was yeah. the archdeacon of, of <laughs> uh, if you ask me who the archdeacon of Bristol was in 1973, I could tell you. But who's who doing stuff today? I'm sorry. There's so much junk in here that anything new just sort of gets put, popped out. Well, I'm je okay. Out I'm on. jealous of Dominic Steele, mostly because it's the coolest name to have. You know, that's a 1980s soap opera name. Uh, to, to have something like that. And uh, he's doing wonderful work, and we really appreciate what he's doing down in Australia. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Congo, and you've been watching episode 779 of Anglican Unscripted.